morning, everyone, and welcome. Just a short PSA before we begin. Even though churches have been deemed essential, which we always knew they were, and have been called upon to reopen immediately, we're not quite ready to do that. We're getting close, but we're, we're not there yet. When we are, uh, trust me, you will be the first to know. We will let everybody know. So please understand that, that your safety is our highest priority, and we're only going to open the doors again when we determine that we can do so safely. So in the meantime, we encourage you to continue to worship with us through our online services. We encourage you to join together with one another through our online gatherings. Uh, this is not ideal, we know that, but it is sufficient. So if you're on your way to the church this morning because you heard that churches are reopening, we encourage you uh, to go back home. I say that with love. Now, we do have a special guest with us today. Uh, Mary Phillips is here uh, this morning. Mary's here because uh, today is Mary's birthday, and Mary wanted to celebrate her birthday by worshiping inside of uh, her church uh, building. Mary's been a part of this church uh, for 46 years. She came here in 1974. So, Mary, we want to wish you a very happy birthday. Those who are watching might be concerned that we have too many people here. Trust me, we have less than 10 people gathered this morning. Now this morning, as we worship, let's look to Jesus and be reminded of his goodness and his grace to us. As our call to worship, we're going to read a passage out of Colossians chapter 1 that encourages us to see Christ for who he is, the King of Kings. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Let's pray together. Father, it's good to be together on these screens this morning, with all of these people watching from so many different places together listening for your voice, united by your spirit, and lifting up your Son. Father, we want everything to be for your glory. We want our thoughts, our words, our songs, our church, our resources, our time, our very lives, all to be for you. Everything we have is yours, and we come together today to declare this to be so. Bless our time together with your holy presence, in Jesus' strong name. Amen. And now our wonderful music director, Nicole Yuen, will lead us in a time of worship. Good morning, and now let's begin with a time of praise and worship. He roars like a lion, he bled as the lamb. 
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that we can call upon your name today. For you alone are worthy of glory, honor, and praise. With you, we know that nothing is impossible and that nothing is beyond your knowledge. And because we know that you are able, we want to lift up those who are sick with the virus. You have the power to heal. And so we ask for mercy and pray that you would bring healing and full restoration to those who have fallen ill. Please also remember those who are waiting to have elective surgeries, chemotherapy, and other specialized medical procedures. We know that your timing is always perfect. Grant them the comfort of your presence as they wait. We pray for protection over the healthy, especially over our vulnerable population. We ask for an extra hedge of protection over our children as we are now learning of the virus impact on the little ones. Watch over all our essential workers as well. We are grateful for these servant leaders who have served and cared for our communities and families. Please provide them and their families everything they need as they continue working. We also want to lift up our president and government officials. May you grant them wisdom, integrity, and humbleness that they would make good decisions for the benefit and welfare of their citizens. We ask that your peace would prevail throughout this land as many groups are arguing 
about when and how to open up the country. We pray especially for believers to rise up to the occasion and represent you well. Father, we now want to thank you for First Baptist Church. Thank you for our pastors who have worked tire tirelessly in bringing the body of Christ together during this unprecedented time. Continue to sustain them and make them steadfast and movable and abounding in their work for you. May you also watch over our church members, heal those who are sick, provide for those who have lost their jobs, comfort those who are grieving, help us to come through the stronger and more unified, empower us to be a people of prayer and faith, embolden us to share the gospel to our unbelieving neighbors and loved ones. Finally, we pray for a revival. Continue to draw this hurting world back to you. May your name be glorified and praised throughout the land. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, First Baptist. Today's scripture reading is from Mark chapter 6, 14 to 29. And it reads as follows. John the Baptist beheaded. King Herod had heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said, he's Elijah. Still others claim he's a prophet, like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, ask me for anything you want. I will give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. At once, the girl hurried into the king with the request, I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was greatly distressed, but because of his oath and his dinner guest, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in prison, and brought back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl. She gave it to her mother. On hearing this, John's disciple came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This is the work of the Lord. Amen. Good morning, First Baptist Church of Flushing. It is so good to worship together with you. I'd like to just uh, give a quick shout out and um, 
very special good morning to Marishri, Andrea, Frankie and Karen, Will Doby, Perla, Cha Cha, Justin, Panama Kevin, Fiona, and Dakota from Hawaii. Good morning. So glad to worship together with you all. Mark Twain once said, a man who carries a cat by the tail learns something he can learn in no other way. There's something to be said about learning from experience, either firsthand or through the experience of others. It is said that uh, there is a hierarchy when it comes to what makes for effective communication, communication that sticks in a person's consciousness. There's a ranking when it comes to what makes a powerful point that will have a lasting impact and now teach a good lesson. At the very bottom are statistics. Statistics that are thrown out there without explanation are just numbers, data that passes by us without making any sort of discernible difference. Then at the very top of effective communication are well-placed stories, stories that make a point. A big part of the effectiveness of a well-told story is that it takes what would otherwise be an abstract concept and then it makes it concrete, putting a face and a name to it. Stories have a way of entering into our lives through the side door, teaching us a lesson without ever having to beat us over the head with the point. Stories show through lived out experience. Perhaps that's why more than half of the Bible is made up of stories, Old Testament narratives, New Testament gospels, accounts of the apostles in the book of Acts. Because through these stories, we gain a sense of how to live and how not to live, and most importantly, of how we fit into the grand story of God's work of redemption. Now today, as we look at the death of John the Baptist and uh, his interactions with King Herod, we get to learn a good lesson from a bad example. This is one of two stories within the Gospel of Mark that is not centered on Jesus, with the other being the ministry of John the Baptist. In our story, what we will see is the role that conscience plays in a person's life. And how we respond to our conscience ultimately determines the trajectory, that is the direction of our lives. Today we're going to explore, one, the role of conscience, what it is and how it works. Two, three ways we can respond when our conscience convicts us. And most importantly, three, what to do when we have a guilty conscience. Let's begin with prayer, and then we'll dig right in. Our Father in heaven, teach us through your word so that we can live wisely and fruitfully for your glory. Remind us of the finished work of Christ, whose blood cleanses us from all unrighteousness and sets us free to live new lives. May this message of the gospel penetrate even the most hardened of hearts so that sinners would praise your name. We pray in the victorious name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. First, the role of conscience. What is our conscience? What role does it play? Our conscience is our moral consciousness. Simply put, your conscience is your internal sense of right and wrong. It's something that the Lord, our creator, has put into every single person. Say you're on a line um, with, with good social distancing waiting to enter into the supermarket. Someone cuts in front of you and you tell them that they just cut the line. Hey, big man, the back of the line is that way. Now, in most cases, the person would apologize and say, oh, I didn't realize there was a line. And then they would proceed to the back. And if they did insist on staying at that spot on the line, the person would give some sort of an appeal to explain why they deserve to be in that place in line at that time. Maybe they would say something like, I was here a minute ago, I had to run to my car to get my mask. Or they would say something like, oh, my friend right here was holding my spot. Throughout the course of my life, I've never heard a single person say, I don't believe in lines. Or, I don't care about your silly customs. You never hear that because there's a universal sense of right and wrong written into our hearts, and that is called the conscience. Now, the way our conscience works is that it serves as an early detection warning system. It alerts us and, and tells us that we're about to do something that is wrong before it happens. 
But it is only an alert that you are acting outside of your own values. Your conscience won't ever force you to do something against your own will. You can always choose to ignore, suppress, or reject your conscience instead of obeying your conscience to your own harm. There's this wonderful book that I read this week called Conscience, What It Is, How to Train It, and Loving Those Who Differ by Andy Nazali and um, J.D. Crawley. The, uh, it's an excellent little book that's well worth uh, a few hours of your time. There's a link to the book in the uh, sermon notes of our church app in case you want to get it. In the book, the authors relate conscience to the tragic Avianca flight that crashed in Spain in 1984. They said this. Investigators studying the accident of that flight made an eerie discovery. The black box cockpit recorders revealed that several minutes before impact, a shrill computer synthesized voice from the plane's automatic warning system told the crew repeatedly in English, pull up, pull up. The pilot, evidently thinking the system was malfunctioning, snapped, shut up, gringo and switched the system off. Minutes later, the plane plowed into the side of the mountain. Everyone on board died. In a way, this tragic story is a perfect parable of the, modern, uh, the way modern people treat the warning messages of their consciences. The wisdom of our age says guilt feelings are nearly always erroneous or hurtful, that we should switch them off. The conscience is generally seen by our world as a defect that robs people of their self-esteem. But far from being a defect or a disorder, however, our ability to sense our own guilt is a tremendous gift from God. He designed our conscience into the framework of the human soul, and it's the automatic warning system that tells us, pull up, pull up, before we crash and burn. This is the role of our conscience. Keep that in mind as we look at the tragic life of Herod Antipas and the three ways that we can respond when our conscience convicts. Verses 14 to 16 of Mark chapter 6. King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said, he is Elijah. Still others claimed he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. Now our passage begins mid-story in the life of Herod Antipas, and it breaks up the flow of the story about Jesus and Mark. The occasion for this break in the flow of the narrative is because Herod has heard about the fame and the power of Jesus. As you may well remember from last week's sermon, the disciples of Christ had gone out in the name and the power of Jesus. They had accomplished all sorts of miracles, all signs and wonders. And as the disciples went out, the fame, the renown of Jesus spread like wildfire. Because now, instead of Jesus doing the work of God alone, there were 12 others doing the will and work of God and producing a multiplied impact. So word gets back to Herod, whispers and rumors about who this Jesus might be. Now, oftentimes, rumors have a way of becoming exaggerated with subsequent tellings until it reaches these mythic proportions. But a discerning person will be able to sniff the truth from fiction as the details of of individual accounts are corroborated, person after person. What Herod hears is report after report from the east side of the Jordan. And there's no doubt in his mind that Jesus is a person sent from God. There was a diversity of opinion regarding his identity. Some claim he was Elijah the prophet returning to Israel to usher in God's reign. Others claim that Jesus was one of the prophets of long ago in the true line of the true prophets of old. But as soon as Herod heard about Jesus, He was convinced that this was John the Baptist raised from the dead. Now, this is what we might call the projections of a guilty conscience. After all, Herod was the one who had imprisoned John the Baptist and then reluctantly beheaded him. Now, to fully understand the dynamics that led up to John the Baptist's death, 
let me briefly lay out some background about King Herod. King Herod is actually not a king at all. Now, to be clear, his daddy, Herod the Great, was a real king. Herod the Great had conquered Jerusalem with the help of the Romans. He was the one who built the second temple of the Jews. He was the one who also murdered all the innocent babies after the birth of Jesus. Now, if that's not confusing enough that there are two people named Herod, five of Herod the Great's other sons were also named Herod. Five. It would be like if Big Tony didn't just have Little Tony, but also Extra Small Tony, Medium Sized Tony, uh, Extra Large Tony, Double XL Tony. Now, if that's not enough, Herodias, the one who wanted John dead, was Herod the Great's granddaughter and also his daughter-in-law because her first marriage was to Herod the Great's son, Herod Philip, our Herod's half-brother and her half-uncle. Now, as you hear these family ties, you start to get a sense of the brokenness within this incestuous family. When Herod the Great dies, the Herod of our story, Herod Antipas, appeals to Caesar to become king, just like his dad. But Caesar Augustus is like, slow your roll, junior player. You're not half the man your daddy was. Matter of fact, I think you're about one-fourth as capable, so I am going to give you control of one-fourth of the territory that your father ruled. And so Herod Antipas becomes Herod the Tetrarch, which is a nice way of saying quarter king. Now, in the early part of his reign, Herod Antipas is constantly fighting through skirmishes against the neighboring territory of uh, Nabatea. And so he does what rulers do to bring peace. Herod marries the daughter of the king of Nabatea. Sometime later, while Herod Antipas is in Rome on official business, he stays with his half-brother, Philip. And it's there that he spends time with Herodias, his brother's wife and his father's granddaughter. Sometimes you just know that some people spell trouble, and boy, was that the case for Herodias. Their adulterous relationship begins. Herod divorces his wife. Herodias divorces her husband, Philip, and that's when the trouble starts. Herod's ex-wife returns to Nabatea. Her father, the king, uses this as a justification to attack, takes a whole chunk of territory, but that barely scratched the surface of his problems. Even though legally, under Roman law, divorce and remarriage was permitted, under God's law written on the human heart, it was clear that this arrangement was not only scandalous, it was immoral. While most normal people would think twice before publicly criticizing the ruler dictator, John the Baptist was no respecter of persons. Verse 18, For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. This is what we would call the direct approach. This is straight out of the John MacArthur School of Preaching. John the Baptist spoke out against Herod's divorce. He spoke out against the remarriage. And when Herod had him arrested, John the Baptist said it to Herod's face. The text uses the words, John had been saying to Herod, which indicates that this was not a one-time confrontation. But John continuously and repeatedly brought this up to Herod. There is a time and place for direct, no-nonsense, truth-telling. It has been said that hard hearts make, hard words make soft hearts. Soft words make hard hearts. John spoke hard words as he heralded the truth of God, and we see that Herod actually responded positively to him. Verses 19 to 20. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Herodias wanted John dead, but it was Herod who protected John because he knew that John was a man sent by God. The text says that Herod liked to listen to John. John spoke with his mouth words that he knew were true in his heart. 
These were the very same words that Herod's own conscience had been nagging him about. He agreed with John because he agreed with his conscience. He knew that everything about this relationship with Herodias was wrong. The problem was that even though he agreed with John, even though he agreed with his own conscience, Herod never went beyond agreement. He never showed it through action. There was no sign of repentance in his life. This is the first way that we can respond when our conscience convicts. We can agree with our conscience, but fail to act. In failing to respond in any demonstrable change of heart and mind, this response is what we would call ignoring our conscience. Ignoring your conscience means you agree with your conscience that uh, when you're confronted with the truth, but you do nothing about it. In Herod's case, he even liked listening to John. John's word had this ring of authenticity. And you can even picture Herod nodding in agreement that he needed to break off his toxic relationship. But when it came time to act, he never did anything about it. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever read your Bible or listened to a sermon or engaged in a conversation with a godly person and just felt the tugging of the Holy Spirit, this tugging of of your own conscience calling you to change the way you live? The whole time you're saying to yourself, you're right. You're absolutely right. I've been going the wrong way. I need to turn it around. But then when the moment's over, you think to yourself, oh, that was good. But then you go right back to whatever you have been doing. That's what it looks like to ignore your conscience. When we know the good that we ought to do, but we choose not to act on it, we ignore our consciences. Author Marva Don remarked how this has become the default position of our society. As we are bombarded with so many messages throughout the day, we find ourselves responding to less and less of it. She calls this, quote, the low information to action ratio, L-I-A-R, liar, because it makes liars out of us. And that's exactly what happens when we fail to act as our conscience convicts. We become liars. We sin against our conscience when we believe that our conscience is speaking correctly to us, and yet we refuse to listen to it. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2 speaks about consciences that have become seared as with a hot iron. If we ignore our conscience when it convicts us, when it pulls and tugs us towards repentance, what ends up happening is a searing effect. When a person's skin comes into contact with something extremely hot, like a red-hot iron, the human body deals with the wound by laying down scar tissue. Now, this scar tissue is not smooth like the rest of your skin. The scar tissue that's been laid down is tough. It's desensitized. The nerve endings have been so seared and destroyed that when we touch the scar, we're no longer sensitive to it. It doesn't feel right. We may not even feel it at all. The point that's being made through this word picture in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, is that when we ignore, when we refuse to listen to our consciences, it becomes desensitized. So that over time, with prolonged neglect, our conscience will actually stop speaking to us. Or more accurately, we won't be able to rightly hear the conviction of our consciences to respond when we need to. How we respond to our conscience determines the direction of our lives. We make the decisions all the time, but sometimes, as one person has said, these decisions turn around and make us. Now, Herod ignored his conscience even though he agreed with it. Herodias then shows us the second way we can respond to our conscience, and that is to suppress and to reject it. Herodias' life is what it eventually looks like when we ignore our conscience over the course of a lifetime. There's no longer a sense of acting in line with right and wrong. It's simply all about getting what we want. What she wanted was to silence all those who opposed her lifestyle. What she wanted was John dead. There's this great line about Herodias by the commentator T.W. Manson, a commentator of long ago. 
He says, Herodias felt the only place where her marriage certificate could safely be written was on the back of the death warrant of John the Baptist. Let me say that one more time. Herodias felt that the only place where her marriage certificate could be safely written was on the back of the death warrant of John the Baptist. But Herod protected John, so she waited for an opportune time. Now the moment came when Herod threw himself a party fit for kings. Many commentators will tell you that this was a lewd party and where guests indulge in all kinds of sensual pleasures. It most likely was that. And yet instead of sending out a professional dancer to perform the exotic dances, Herodias sends out her own teenage daughter, Herod. Her stepfather was so pleased that in his drunken bravado, he proclaims to the whole assembly of guests, verses 22 and 23. He says, ask me for anything you want and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom. Now, technically, he did not have half of a kingdom to give because it all belonged to the Romans. But that's besides the point. Verses 24 to 28, she went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. At once the girl hurried in to the king with the request, I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was greatly distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man beheaded John in the prison and brought back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. Herodias's conscience had become so hardened that she had no problem with the gruesome execution of John. Herod's own conscience plagued him, but not enough to do the right thing. And because of that, a righteous man was martyred for his faith. This ignoring and then suppressing and rejecting of their consciences explains why by the time Jesus is brought to Herod with his Herod with his seared conscience. Herod saw Christ not as the Son of God, but simply as a spectacle, like a person who could show him a cool bar trick. The historian Josephus tells us that Herod and Herodias themselves come to a tragic end. Under Herodias' urging, Herod went to the new Caesar, Caligula, to ask to be called king, to actually have the title. But Caesar saw this as a treasonous act and banished them both to Gaul in what is now modern-day France. The first way you can respond to your conscience is to ignore it. The second way you can respond to your conscience is to suppress it, to reject it. Finally, the right way to respond to your conscience is to obey it. We see this in John the Baptist and in all who walk in the way of Jesus. John spoke hard words to Herod when men of lesser characters would have chosen the way of convenience and simply remained silent. To have a clear conscience, though, is a source of great joy and peace. But there's often a cost. For John, it costs him his very life, and it will carry a cost for all who walk in the way of Jesus. Perhaps the primary reason why Mark situates this passage right in between the successful ministry of the disciples that we looked at last week, and the feeding of the 5,000 that we'll cover next week is to show the cost of discipleship, that there is a cost to following Jesus, that there's a cost to obeying your conscience and living in line with the truth. It's a call to both joy and pain. But to obey your conscience as it's shaped by the word of God is the only way to live a successful Christian life. Now, life is rarely so binary where we're either ignoring our conscience in the way that Herod did or fully obeying our consciences in the way that John the Baptist did. The reality is that most of us are somewhere in between with a desire to obey our conscience, but finding ourselves to be half-hearted creatures, living with regret of dabbling with sin. What do we do then when we find ourselves have ignored our consciences and now played with a guilty conscience that rightly condemns us. Friends, we have one who died in our place as a substitutionary atonement for our sins. One who has paid for our sins, past, present, and future. 
The blood of Jesus will cleanse your conscience. And more than that, the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse you of all of your sins. In 1 John 1, 9, it tells us that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. As we turn to Christ in confession and repentance, the blood of Jesus purifies us from all sins. Andy Nazelli recounts a scene from the Pilgrim's Progress in which Christian faces off with Apollyon. After Apollyon accurately accuses Christian of a series of sins, Christian basically replies, you're right, but I'm actually even worse than that. That disarming statement sets up the death blow. Apollyon accused, you almost fainted when you first set out, when you almost choked in the swamp of despond. You almost attempted to get rid of your burden in the wrong way instead of patiently waiting for the prince to take it off. You sinfully slept and lost your scroll. You were almost persuaded to go back at the sight of the lions. And when you talk of your journey of what you have heard and seen, you inwardly desire your own glory in all you do and say. This is all true. And much more uh, that you have failed to mention, Christian agreed. But the prince whom I now serve and honor is merciful and ready to forgive. Besides, these infirmities possessed me while I was in your country, for there I allowed them to come in. But I have groaned under them, have been sorry for them, and have obtained pardon from my prince. Our prince, Jesus Christ, sets us free from the condemnation of both the devil and our own consciences so that we can now walk in the way of the Spirit in conformity to the will of God. This is the great privilege of all who have put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, to all who call on his name. Have you put your trust in him? If you're not yet a believer in the Lord Jesus and you sense your conscience tugging at you to respond, please don't just listen and leave unchanged. Turn to him. Give your life to him. Experience the joy and peace of a cleansed conscience and the hope of an eternity with God. Let's all go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that we have a Redeemer, a Savior, who has cleansed us of all of our sin so that now we can live with clean consciences clear before you, having all of our sins past, present, and future forgiven, nailed to the tree. I pray for those who have not turned to you yet. I pray that you would prompt them so that they may give their lives to you, that they would acknowledge Jesus as Lord, that they would confess that they, like all people, have sinned and fallen short, but that there is one who can save, Jesus Christ our Lord. Help us now as we live Help us that we can live as people who obey our consciences and help us so that increasingly as we obey, our consciences would be more and more in line, trained and and recalibrated so that it would fall in line with your will, Lord. Thank you for your great love for us. Thank you that you have made us your own. It's because of this we have hope and we have life. In Jesus' victorious name we pray, amen. night, yet thought I knew the way, the sin that promised joy and life had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own a rebel to your will, and if you had not loved me first, I would refuse you still. I ran my hellbound race, indifferent to the cost. You looked upon my helpless state and led me to the cross, and I.
never come from me. Oh, Father, use my ransomed life in any way you choose, and let my song forever be. We do want to welcome you to our online service this morning. Pastor Aaron, we thank you so much for opening God's Word to us uh, today. Um, we hope that you're uh, enjoying your time of worship. Just take a, a couple of moments to extend a, a warm welcome to those near to you, either in your living room or dining room or wherever you're worshiping today. Just greet those near to you. We have a few announcements for you uh, this morning. Uh, the first one is this. We have prepared a church survey for you. It's a very simple survey for, uh, to help us know how to provide the best possible spiritual care for the First Baptist Church family. If you've not yet filled that out, then please take a moment sometime today or tomorrow. It'll just take you a couple of minutes to fill this out, and that, that will help us to know how best to connect with you, and we would just love to, to hear from you. Uh, Monday noon prayer. Uh, every Monday at noon, Pastor Aaron leads us in a half hour of drawing near to God in prayer. Even though tomorrow is Memorial Day, we encourage you to join us for this time of prayer. I mean, after all, where do you have to go tomorrow? You know, parks and beaches are semi-open, but not really. So whatever you're doing tomorrow, just stop, pause, and join us for that time of prayer, and then go back to whatever it is you're doing. The link to the prayer meeting is posted in the comments. Uh, Grief Share is an online support group for those grieving the loss of a loved one. If you are experiencing and, and grieving such a loss, uh, we encourage you to, to either join, visit, or just check out this online support group. It meets Thursday nights from 7 to 9 p.m. You can come in, you can just observe, you can participate at whatever level uh, you're comfortable with. Ministry of Mercy, also known as MOM. Even though stores are beginning to, to reopen, our Ministry of Mercy remains active. If you or someone you know uh, needs help getting groceries or a prescription or, or anything like that, then uh, you can send mom. Send mom. You can contact Maria Chung, and she'll let you know how you could connect into this ministry. Story time. If the Lord has been at work in or through your life in any way, uh, we would encourage you to share your story of God's faithfulness with the, with the church family. So if you have a story to share, then just contact Pastor Aaron and he'll tell you how you can uh, record and share that uh, with the congregation. Now it's time for our morning offering. Uh, we are so thankful for your continued support uh, of the ministry of First Baptist Church, even during this time of separation and, and isolation. Uh, your faithful and generous giving has enabled us to maintain all of our missionary obligations our day-to-day -day, uh, operations here at the church, supporting our staff, and so many other things. So we do thank you for your uh, continued giving. There are three ways to, to give to the ministry of First Baptist Church. You can give through the church app, you can give through the church website, or you can simply mail your offering into the church. If you'd like, you could stop by the church, you could uh, ring the doorbell, there will be people in the building to, to greet you from a, from a safe distance, and you could do that as well. I'll pray, and then we'll receive our offering. Uh, would you bow your heads with me as I pray? Father, we thank you for the gift of your Son. Father, we thank you that you've provided for us a Savior, a Redeemer, one who came into this world to bear our sins in his own body on the cross, that we might become the children of God. Father, in response to your amazing love for us, we give back to you a small portion of what you have blessed us with, we ask that you will receive the offering from us, that you will give us wisdom in how we apply it, that it will be put towards the work of your kingdom. 
for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now we have a, a short missions moment to uh, present to you. Joy Dawkins will present this to us. Hi, First Baptist. I hope you're all feeling well. I just wanted to offer some encouragement from our missionaries as we all are grappling with the effects of the COVID-19 on our daily lives. Psalm 27, 13 says, I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. This is happening at a time when technology is um, at its best. So many of our missionaries, instead of staying home and not doing anything, they're using what is available. In Canada, Don and Nancy Rempel, they are reaching out to um, people using Skype and WhatsApp. They're giving uh, English lessons, they're providing prayer support, and they're providing information for the Muslim uh, community. This is the month of Ramadan, and they're also using the opportunity to provide dates. Many Muslims break their fast by eating dates. So Don and Nancy use these small gifts of dates to show the love of Christ. And we pray that these seeds that are being sown will bear fruit much later. At the same time, Pastor Dominic and Glad his wife Gladys are continuing their manna ministry which, in which they give bread and they use that opportunity to hang bags of bread on the doorknobs of Muslim people. And as they uh, come to the door, the uh, Dom Pastor Dominic is standing uh, six feet away from the door. He'll wait till somebody opens the door. They see the bread, uh, the loaf of bread and they have a short conversation and uh, share the love of Christ. So we pray that that will also be used for his honor and, and his glory. On the African continent, uh, the virus has been slow to arrive there, but it's now going ahead full speed. In Senegal, uh, Dakar, the uh, capital, is come to a halt. Uh, all the businesses are closed, all the schools are closed, and this has had a tremendous effect on the economy. Uh, at the same time, uh, our missionary Susan uh, is stationed in Donville, and that has had very little uh, impact uh, from the uh, virus at this stage. So since his children are um, out of school, they Susan has found that they're open to hearing the gospel, listening. They're listening. They have this time on their hands. So she has been going and ministering one-to-one -one and speaking to many different people about the love of Christ. So we continue that the Lord will keep her safe and uh, continue to use the words that she uh, shares in um, their native language. We also um, have news from Central African Republic where our missionaries Jack and Thea Robinson report that the theological seminary has been closed. And unlike the U.S. where many people have moved online to uh, continue their coursework, uh, many students at the university in Bongi cannot afford to do that because they don't have uh, computers. It's very expensive to have a computer uh, electricity is very expensive so um, at this time they're just continuing their own studies based on the coursework that they had and uh, we pray especially for them that when things are um, returned to normal that they will be able to continue their studies and uh, continue to um, be fruitful in their work for the work for the Lord uh, in Israel uh, Pastor Zadok, who's in this photo, uh, he uh, had just returned from uh, the United States, and since he was here, he had to be, he was put in quarantine, and um, that's why he's wearing his, his mask in this picture. And um, but he, he and his team sees these struggles that we're facing as opportunities. 
one of the opportunities that have presented themselves is to reach out to uh, the elderly. The elderly at this time feel very isolated and they distrust people uh, and they are really in search of someone or some people who express genuine concern. Uh, so uh, Pastor Zedek and his team have been going out and uh, uh, contacting uh, many of the elderly and giving calls to see how they're feeling, how they're doing, offering to go buy groceries to take them to the doctor's visits and so forth. They also he also continues with um, the children's um, Sunday school uh, via Skype, and uh, there is also Facebook, uh, the platform that's being used. So instead of uh, sitting ho home and um, being despondent, uh, many of our missionaries are reporting that they're just using the technology and the opportunity to uh, reach out to uh, God's um, people and also to new contacts uh, as God leads to um, spread the word of God. So I, I hope you'll be encouraged by that. And now for our benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God bless you all. Amen.